Well, hello everyone. Welcome to a new interview at Shogunet Gaming News. And today we'll we'll try to have the view from one of the most relevant uh, suppliers for the online gaming industry, which is Play and Go. And for that, we are joined today by Magnus Olson, who is the head of sales and account management at the company. So welcome, Magnus. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Great. So. Um, Recently, Play and Go, uh, well, when, when 2020 was over, uh, said that it had fulfilled its uh, commitment, its 25 game com commitment for, for the year. Uh, so maybe you, you can share with us uh, your new global commitments for the company for, for 2021, and maybe the goals and expectations for this year in, in the different markets where you have operations, especially in the in the in Europe and UK. Absolutely, yes, uh, be happy to. So as you said, uh, 2020, we ramped up the production of games quite significantly to uh, 52 games, <clears throat> basically uh, one game a week. Uh, and that went well. I think, um, um, you know, the reactions I've seen is that uh, people uh, believe that we maintained quality and, um, and they, we met expectations of, um, of our customers, uh, even with this increased pace. So 2021, we are aiming for uh, 60 games, which is, slightly more than 52. And we'll do it a bit differently this year. Um, I think you can expect about a game a week from us. Um, and then on top of that, we will add a couple of surprises um, that will be outside of the normal. So we'll keep the same pace as last year and then we add a little extra on top. That's kind of the the thought of the roadmap this year and um, yeah, when it um, that what we're doing uh, we, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that more later but we um, we have some interesting collaborations that I, I'd love to tell you about in terms of markets uh, I'm very happy to see Latin America growing for us we um, we more than doubled our business there uh, in 2020 um, in Europe, it's a mixed bag. It's, well, I would say that it's um, regulation is moving in into almost every country. And that is a really, really good thing. We, we like regulated markets. We think it's good. Um, and we see that, for example, UK, as you mentioned, what happens in UK is that the regulation puts um, puts pressure into the system, right? And at, you know you can discuss the details on the regulation, but the end goal is is very similar to what we want. The the regulators in the UK they want to provide a safe and reliable environment for online entertainment, right? And that is our business purpose we we want to provide safe and reliable digital entertainment so we we looking at the long term on on uh, a country like uk we see enormous potential and we see growth uh, and we see it where we can work in very very close partnerships with the operators to and the regulators for that matter, to kind of um, fulfill that promise of safe digital entertainment. Great, so you'll be, uh, let's say, excited about this, this UK review that, that the government is, 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 is undertaking right now? I, I don't want to review it, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I think there's definitely <laughs> stuff in there that um, they can do differently. Um, I'm not a big fan of um, when regulation is uh, micromanaging uh, how the games perform or um, when they try to... So look, I think there's kind of two forces at play here. One is the drive to provide, provide safety and trust, which is good. And the other one is trying to limit or suppress the industry, which is bad. Um, I think I have to ask them, but I, I would say that the politicians and, and the people um, behind the laws 
might be torn between the, the need for, they want the taxes, they want the income, and they also want to um, look as they, they are standing up uh, towards uh, something that might be perceived as a bad thing. So I think the way out of that is to focus on, on the entertainment side and um, focus on um, providing that safety and, and an, an entertainment industry in a safe environment. So yeah, there's long answer to a short question. There's details in the regulation I think is completely wrong. I do agree on, on the main purpose behind the regulations, you know, aiming for that safety. I see, right. I don't know if you want to add something about the um, something that is very trendy these days in the gaming industry, which is the, the US regulations across the, the different states. What's the approach for, for, from, from Play and Go? We, um, we've been looking at US for uh, the better part of a year. And um, I'm happy to say that we will be we expect our games to be live in you in the in New Jersey around July mid this year. So we are well ahead in the process, and um, we are entering New Jersey first, and then we have two or three other states in the pipeline after that. But uh, definitely, I mean, the U.S. it's it's such a such an amazing market. I have the utmost respect for the tradition and um, the relationship they have with uh, gambling and you know it they've been at it for so long and being part of them taking the step to online I think it's it's um, it's an honor it's a great thing and I also think that this is a this is an area where we can come in from Europe we can bring our experience and our, um, we know what works and what doesn't work in, in, in Europe. Part of that will be applicable in the US for sure. And uh, if we do this right, we can, um, um, we can add a lot of value to the US market. So I'm look, very much looking forward to that. And I also think we have content that uh, suits that market, definitely. I see, great. Well, since you're talking about uh, getting into new markets, uh, maybe, well, recently the company said that it plans to explore new territories. Uh, so can you share, other than, than the US, uh, other plans for this year in terms of expansion, new markets, and, and, and also uh, what you mentioned earlier, the new partnerships uh, coming, coming for, for 2021? Yeah. So um, in terms of new markets, we, um, we entered Switzerland uh, just a couple of months ago and uh, we are in I think we're pretty much done with uh, Greece so we're going into Greece within days or weeks um, and we're looking at Georgia and Ukraine in Eastern Europe they are both very interesting markets so they are a bit further down the pipeline the US as I mentioned that's um, it, Entering the U.S., everybody who's done it knows that it eats a lot of resources, right? It eats uh, time and, and money and resources. So that is a major undertaking for anyone and also for us. And at the same time, we have Germany and the Netherlands working on regulations. These are already now major markets for us. So, of course, we're going to, um, as soon as there's a regulation there, we will, we will work to be part of it from day one. That would be the ambition. And um, I've been for many years, I've been looking at uh, what they're doing in Japan. I, I like the Japanese market. I think they have a gaming culture that is fun. And um, it, it would be a good market for us. However, there's so many delays and there's so much uh, back and forth on the integrated resource discussion in Japan. So I kind of, for now, that's on, on a, a back burner, I think. Uh, we, are, we, need, we need more clarity on what they're aiming for in Japan. And um, then, of course, the Buenos Aires, we, we are well ahead with both the 
city and a province. So that will, as soon as uh, everything is ready, we will be there definitely this year, hopefully within weeks. And um, a bit the same as Japan with Brazil. You know, they, they've been talking and they've been uh, discussing and, you know, I really would like to see Brazil regulate and um, that's also an awesome market. We have, we have a portfolio of games that's almost tailor-made for Brazil with our bingo games. So, so can't wait for that to happen. But in order of priority, it's Greece will happen now, New Jersey, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Georgia and Ukraine, and then we are monitoring uh, Japan, Brazil, and also I forgot Buenos Aires city and region that will also happen now. That's the markets we're working on now. And some of these markets, it's it is a lot of paperwork, and it is a it is a process you have to uh, walk through. So it's a lot of work from our compliance department. But I imagine. And um, what about uh, in terms of, well, I, I will mix two questions in one into one. I mean, um, what kind of partnerships would you be after and, and, and what are your strategies to, to be competitive in this, in this new market in terms of, well, we, we've seen many sequels to your, to your games uh, last year, but you also said, uh, you also highlight always uh, that, uh, that every game has a different feel from the, from the previous one. Uh, maybe in, in a week, in, in two days, uh, in a gap of two days that, that they were launched into the market and, and they are very different from each other. So uh, how do you keep this, this imbalance, no? these, these, uh, these sequels and the, and the, and the innovation in, within your, your content? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a really good question. And that's, um, we got lots of people working on exactly that. Uh, so we, you can say that the, the 2021 roadmap is built on three pillars, three major themes on, on the games. One is the sagas or the sequels or whatever you like to call them. We are building on that, but we're doing, doing that differently than 2020. So we take the environment that a game exists in, for example, Reactoons or um, the the, uh, Rick, the family wild games, Rick Wild, Cat Wild. So say Reactoons for example, Reactoons exists in a in a made up universe. We can create more action and more adventure in that universe, and it will not be a Reactoons three or Reactoons four necessarily. That could also happen, but. It could be games that complement that storyline and that saga and build out that experience. And what we also do, will do more and more, and you can see it now if you go to uh, our YouTube channel or our um, Instagram or whatever, that we are taking, we're experimenting right now with the storyline of Cat Wild and taking that into a cartoon environment. So. It kind of goes out be that universe is, is expanding outside of the slot and online casino world. So it becomes a story, a, a media event on its own, basically. So that's kind of a direction, if you like. Um, and we're taking baby steps, but it's uh, definitely um, a new thing and definitely um, a very, very interesting way to develop. So that's kind of the first pillar of the roadmap. Secondly, I would say that the partnerships we do with the IP games, um, you've probably seen our music games like Twisted Sister or Saxon or uh, those games. Um, what we do, uh, instead of just buying the, the property rights for a, a song or a face or a name, we enter collaborative agreements with the artist or the performer where that specific artist is involved in the creation of the material and the game, the marketing of it and the sales of it. 
One good example is that we had the Snyder from Twister Sister uh, at ICE in London last time. And um, the Snyder took a great interest in, in the game and the development. And, and um, we kind of look for that type of collab collaboration. So this year we will have between four and six different collaborations with very big names in the industry. Also names that resonates very well with the US markets. So I look very much forward to that. I think um, especially, you know, when, when we can put this terrible uh, COVID-19 situation behind us and start to travel and meet, I, I can't wait to show you guys what type of persons I can bring with me to the meets and greets and what, what lineups we have in terms of collaborative partners that not only are there to um, push a game, but also takes a personal interest in the whole process. And this, these are names that are going to resonate well. So that's the second part of the pillar. And the third part, I'll keep that short, is basically innovation. It's taking slots and online casino to the next level. We took some steps with Gold Volcano and Diamond Vortex and a few other games last year where we create slot games that have math, graphics, and a look and feel that, that hasn't been seen before. So that will, we're going to build on that as well. So those three pillars is the roadmap. You know, it's the sagas, it's the IP games, it's innovation. That's how we approach it. That's yeah, very clear. Uh, well, maybe we can um, round off with uh, with some final comments about this. Uh, since you mentioned uh, this this pandemic situation, what are uh, maybe the, the new the new demands from operators and and, and also players uh, amid this global shift towards the from offline to online? Uh, in general, right? Um, what are the new challenges that you see this year um, in the global I gaming mean, industry, and uh, maybe growth potential? Uh, for, That's for yes. Yeah, I will split that question in two if you if, if, sure. if you, okay, because one is um, the pandemic specifically, what the, the, what that is driving, and the second part would be what are the challenges for iGaming gaming in general. So um, pandemic-wise, I think the only thing, or not the only thing, that's um, a bit flippant, but what the pandemic has, show, has done for, uh, for the industry, for almost all industries, is to accelerate something that was happening anyway. You know, we've seen with Netflix and Uber and um, uh, that kind of um, trend, trends or companies that... Airbnb, etc. If something can be digitalized, it will be digitalized. So that will happen. People will buy clothes online. People will um, select a movie online. People will order their taxi online. People will play games online. So that is not something that you can try to stop. Or um, there's no there's no going back on that trend. You know that digitalization is happening and there's no return. So what's happened this year and, or what happened in 2020 was that we moved five years ahead in the development in one year because of the lockdowns and, and all those terrible things that happened uh, to the society. Um, though the digitalization accelerated 5x or more. What the impact for, for land-based casinos, for brick and mortar casinos, this has been terrible. I mean, that's, um, they are fighting for their lives now and uh, no wonder, I mean, they can't accept guests in and, and uh, they, they are basically not allowed to be open. So it's a terrible situation for them. I think the way forward for, for land-based is, is, I'm completely sure they need to embrace the digitalization and they need to make it work for them. So we have products for that. Many other companies have. Um, what they need, they need to 
think out a, a strategy and a way to one, attract new customers. You, remember, we have a generation now, millennials, their first gaming experience was online, right? So they will look at content and they will look at uh, environment and um, the offering in a way uh, that they look at online. For example, they are immersed in, in uh, social media. If, if they are going to do an activity like going to a casino, that activity has to be able to be shared online. People have to react on it. People have to be able to interact with that experience that they are sharing online. If there's no interaction with social media and digitalization of um, that event, you will not get the millennials to, to visit your uh, uh, your propriety, uh, your uh, casino or whatever, whatever it is. So you have to embrace that social media and that millennial culture. They, um, they have different um, interests and, and uh, you have to appeal to a culture that is interested in healthy food, animal rights, gender equality, all those things needs to be there if you want that audience that is now online, right? So there's a great opportunity for brick and mortar casinos to embrace this and to build something that is coexisting and working together with online. There is ways for us to drive traffic from online to land-based and back, back and forth. There's technology and there's um, and marketing things we can do together. Um, but it requires that land-based and online works hand in hand and not is not perceived as competitors. So I think that's what the pan pandemic did for us was just accelerating this five years. It would have happened anyway. So I think that's... And Go, go to the second part of your question, the iGaming industry in general, what, what, are, what are the challenges? Mm -hmm. I, the major thing that's happening is regulation. We have to, um, because what regulation does, it, it drives up cost. So it's more expensive to operate in, an, in a regulated market. That's rare. You are limited on marketing and bonuses and all those things um, compared to without, without any regulation. So it's more expensive to acquire customers. It's more expensive to just run the company. And so the cost goes up. That means uh, shrinking margins. And for a while, the operator solution to that was to push the cost downstream to suppliers. And that's not a viable route anymore because that kind of reached its end. So now they need to improve their top line and bottom line at the same time. They need to grow revenue, cut costs, and, and to maintain the margin, right? So that drives mergers and acquisitions, as we've seen. Um, been lots of that in Europe, and I expect much more. Look at Flutter, for example. They got so many great brands under the wings now with uh, Paddy Power, Betfair, PokerStars, FanDuel, Sky. That's an awesome company. How do you compete with that? You know, you need to you need to match them in size, and you need to um, give them give them that fight on all those markets and with all those profiles, right? And there's companies out there who can do that. Bet three sixty five, William Hill. There's many many others. So you have M and A. You have that um, that drive to uh, mergers and acquisitions, and um, then you have to look at how do you compete? How do you take market share? And you do that, my, my opinion is that you do that with um, differentiation, quality and differentiation. You need, to, you need to know your, you need to be able to acquire not only your competitor's customer because there's a, there's a circle or there's a churn here where much of the acquisition is moving players from one operator to another. We need to get net new players in. Again, I'm getting back to the millennials 
You know, you don't reach them with TV commercials, for example. You have to do something else. How do you reach millennials? That's what the operators need to think about. How do they build up a new customer base? You might frown at the millennials because they have no money, but in five years, they're going to sit on 30% of the uh, gross national uh, of the wealth in the world. So acquire new net new customers, build with differentiation, know where you want to go, have a strategy, build on quality. All those things are way for you to work on both your top line and bottom line, which you have to do if you want to survive, because it's going to be, the cost is going up, mostly driven by regulation and the competitiveness is fierce. You know, it's, there are so many good players out there and there's so, so much good content. So you have to be at your very best all the time. And you know, an operator will soon, they will, there won't be any room to push content that is not good enough. Because even if you have cheap, lower quality content, you push that and there's no audience, then you, you lose the audience, they move away and you lose long-term revenue. So those short-term gains, the winner will be those who look beyond that, who can maintain a strategy that's multi-year and then build on that and execute on it with trust and um, belief in themselves. So yes, mergers and acquisitions, higher costs, more uh, need for differentiation, quality, innovation, and um, def definitely differentiation. Well, Magnus, I think it's uh, it's all very interesting topics and insights from you today. So uh, well, thank you very much for for outlining, outlining this uh, this this for us, at Chovenet, and I definitely look forward to to follow up on them soon in another in another interview. Yes, I, same here, and hopefully we can uh, meet face to face one day soon and um, have conversations in real time. Hopefully, we can. Good. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. This is the last. Bye.